The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Coffee with Coffee. Express the CV, and I think the proper way to say I know the proper way to say that is C um, sub V. Now, if you say that quickly, C sub V, it sounds almost like a, a country in Eastern Europe, but it is, in fact, um, the way they describe the flow coefficient. Um, for this discussion, I'm just going to call it CV. I think most of the people, when they go in and they ask for a component and they're looking for that um, information, they refer to it as CV. But I think it's important first to uh, to put up a definition of what this what this means, and then we'll go through how this pertains to different products and how it pertains to your designs and to your job and stuff. So, again, I did a lot of research on this, and there's a lot to not learn and to know out there. And of course, with the internet, it's it's readily available. But most of the information that I found came from manufacturers of valves and components. And when we talk about CV, it not only applies today. We'll be talking mainly about water-based system, but it does applied in liquids and vapors and, and saturated steam and even pneumatic controls and valves and devices and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm barely scratching the surface on what's um, involved in this whole flow coefficient discussion, but I think it's appropriate to what we do and to what you do perhaps. So um, basically what we've got then is the volumes of water in U.S. gallons at 60 degree Fahrenheit temperature that will throw flow through a valve or a device. Now when I say device, that could be a, you know, a separator or something like that. It's not just the valve with a one pressure drop across the valve. Um, I saw one analogy considered it to be a capacity index. Again, there's a lot of different ways that people interpret this and explain this. I thought this, to me, made the most amount of sense, and I think uh, uh, the formulas and stuff will kind of substantiate that definition. So for an example here then, uh, let me get my little pointer. Somebody, I got some good uh, tips about using some of my tools when I do this. Thanks for that. Um, so down here, this TV of two then, would be that a two gallon minute flow through a valve or a device would have a one pressure drop across that device or valve. So if you had a pressure gauge, a differential pressure gauge that could measure the pressure on you know, the inlet and outlet side of that, at this flow rate at two, you would have a one PSI drop and that's how they come up with the CV formula, the number of CV. Now you'll also see this expressed sometimes in metric units because um, especially with coloping components, you know, we're, we're sell worldwide. so. Uh, most of the rest of the world um, works in metric units, so you'll see this expressed sometimes as KV. So it'd be K sub uh, V. Also sounds like a country, but it's not either. Um, and that would be cubic meters per hour. That the temperature is 16 C with a one bar pressure drop. So instead of using the English terms up here of uh, GPM and, and GPM and uh, pressure is uh, PSI, we just put that in the metric terms. And there's again how you could go back and forth from one to the other. There's the, um, the, the numbers that you use to convert back and forth. What we try and do on all the, the products that we have is when we show our um, the sheets that I'll be showing you here in a minute, we show them both, CV and uh, KV. It does make it a little bit more complicated on the graph, but again, it makes it so it can be used uh, readily anywhere in, in the world, basically. So now down at the bottom, this paragraph is, is important here. When we start talking about the CV value, uh, let's say a ball valve, for instance, um, this value would be in the full open position. So if you had a ball valve that, let's say, had a CV of 11 or perhaps 13, that indicates when the valve is fully open. Now, as you start um, closing or choking down that valve, um, you get to the point when you close it off completely, of course, and the CV um, goes to zero. So there are some valves that um, I'm going to show you here at the beginning just to kind of introduce you a little bit to some valves that you can um, adjust and you can change that. So let me, uh, uh, that you can adjust the CV on. So let me go back to my little tool here, move to the next slide. Bob, while you're doing that, maybe you can crank up the volume a little bit. We had some feedback that the um, it was difficult to hear in some cases. All right, yeah, let me, I'll just speak a little bit louder. I, I, I'm cranked up on, I'm using my phone, by the way, instead of my computer, so I'll, I'll just speak a little clear a little bit louder. So here's an example of a couple uh, balancing valves. And what's different about these two valves is they're both used to uh, balance flow through a, a hydronic or some sort of, a, some sort of a fluid system. And you'll notice the look of uh, these two valves differs a little bit. And this valve over here on the left is what's considered a fixed um, uh, orifice. The CV doesn't change on this valve. So if you notice on these two valves where the pressure ports, the test ports are on this in relation to where the, uh, I got a cutaway coming up, I'll explain this a little bit clearer, that this valve here is fixed and this one here with the pressure ports on either side of where the adjustment mechanism, you can actually vary the CV of this valve. So let me show you what that looks like a little bit on um, 
the sheet that would come with this valve. So if you go all the way out to the, the far right-hand end of this and you would um, lock this valve based on the full open position, you would have a CV of a 3.43 on this valve. And that indicates with this valve, obviously all the way open at the top of the, of the scale here, number four, would have a, a CV of 3.43. Now, as you crank this valve down and you adjust the different numbers on the scale here on the knob that I'm showing up on the upper right-hand side, it does change the CV of that valve. So, for instance, if you put that at the position number two, you would see the CV of that valve has now changed to 1.60. So there are different ways that you can um, balance systems and these valves would be applied uh, for different type of applications depending on what kind of adjustability you need or desire in the system. And here's an example of a cutaway of the um, the 130 valve. And you can see here, this is the Venturi, the orifice that I'm talking about. That being fixed in, in this position here between these two test ports is why that relationship doesn't change. So change in the adjustment here, yes, you can change the flow. You can balance with this valve, but you can't change this relationship here. And that's why it's read across these two on either side of that, where the previous slide we showed the valve, where this was on both sides of the adjustable mechanism. So. Um, I think I, I've got more on balances as we go through there, so I don't want to get a sidetrack. Let me get back a little bit to my equation here. So now in this type of valve, this would come with this type of chart here. So you can see what we've got over here. Let's select, for example, a three-quarter size, and we'll say that the um, and the full open position of the knob there to be position number six, which is on the top of this knob, not on the side. That valve would have a CV of a 5.19. So that's the um, pressure drop across the entire valve in the full open position. Now over here, as we start making adjustments to this valve, we read across these two here with a differential meter. And you can see now going down the three-quarter valve, the CV as we read across these ports is 6.40. So that hopefully that clears it up a little bit about the two different types of valves and how they perform differently and how they adjust differently. So let's get back to the form of how we express this uh, mathematically. I gave you kind of my definition of what the uh, CV uh, flow coefficient is, but this kind of expresses it mathematically. So again, uh, CV over here would be equal to F flow rate in gallons, uh, U.S. gallons per minute in our example here. And the square root of uh, SG being the specific gravity using water, that would be 1, divided by the delta P, which would be the pressure drop across the valve, again, measured across those ports that I showed you on the valve, and I'll show you the test apparatus here in a minute that is um, the standard for doing this type of testing that we come up with these numbers. But I want to talk a little bit about the history of this, because as I researched this, I said, well, why, why do we have this number? Where, who made this up? Where did it come from? So the information that I can find is uh, it's a company started by William Mason back in 1882, and they dealt a lot with steam back in those days, so he manufactured different uh, devices and components and valves for steam. And um, the company name changed as they acquired another company, I believe it was out of Southern California, the Neelian Company. So the name changed from Mason Valve Company to um, Mason Neelian, um, which is still around. It's been, over the years, it's been uh, acquired and changed uh, hands, different owners. But they introduced this concept, and the best I can find was in 1944, they introduced this concept, this theory of flow coefficient, just trying to get everybody on the same page. And the industry did adopt this as kind of the yardstick to, um, to rate valve capacity. So um, again, I put some of the, the credits to where I found some of this information. This uh, um, company now has been absorbed by Dresser, and I think a lot of you people, in, in the, uh, certainly in the industrial valve side, under, uh, know that name Dresser, and the Dresser coupling was uh, one of their products. Um, I also found some interesting information, just a little trivia, on this company as I went around. I went to the Lehman Brothers site. They've got a really good business archive. There's a lot of financial data there, but what's interesting, I found that over the years, uh, different companies that have, have uh, acquired um, uh, Mason Neely and Company, uh, McGraw, Edison, Halliburton, at one point, currently it's a subsidiary of Dresser. What was interesting, too, is this company um, built the engine that was in the Stanley Steamers, which was interesting, because the Stanley Steamer, uh, going way back to 1889, uh, I believe, to 1905, actually, for many years, outside of gasoline automotive uh, engine, so that was kind of interesting to find. But so now the standard has been uh, is being governed and being um, kind of uh, held by the ISA, which stands for the Instrument Society of America. Um, there's also an ANSI standard, the standard right here, that um, relates to the keeping of the standard. So what happens now with the ISA is they've got a board of directors, a board of uh, um, trustees, 
and they um, they keep the standard, and they do make some uh, revisions every now and then, like I believe it was 1981 where they adopted the metric um, units to, to use this also. So again, at the bottom, some of my sources. Another thing I wanted to say is on these slides for the first time, I put a number at the bottom here. So as you guys have questions as I'm going through and, and you type in a question, um, you know, refer to the slide number so I can go back to that or make sure that I answer the question. We will, as always, try and answer questions as we go along. I've got my team up in Milwaukee. Mark Olson's up there monitoring questions. Um, he will interrupt if there's a, a good question that we can answer while we're on the slide, just for the benefit of the whole group. I do get back to everybody. Um, I try to get back at, at the same day. You know, at the end of this uh, go-to-meeting, send us a report. All the questions that you typed in will be there. I wanted to say, uh, I should have said this earlier, a couple of them that I respond to the last time. When I get the, um, on the last webinar, when I get that, all I do is I go to that, um, that printout from GoToMeeting and uh, just highlight and copy and paste your email and also your question into the body of an email and I send a response. And I had a couple of uh, bounce back as undeliverable. So we're not ignoring you. If you've asked a question and you didn't get an answer, please uh, you know contact either through the website or um, call Coloppy. We want to make sure that we get to everybody. And uh, I don't always have the exact right answer right away, so I'll consult with my colleagues and uh, the team up in Milwaukee. And if I have to go right back to the factory, the person that's actually making that valve, we will try and get you the answer for your question. So thanks for your um, your patience with that. All right, so now this formula, now that we have it, you can get it a little bit tighter. And now what we've done to the formula here is we've pulled in another equation here to the left. And what we want to do here is if you notice in the formula and the definition of uh, CV, we're looking at water at a temperature of 60 degrees. Well, for the most part, hydronic systems operate at a higher temperature than that. It could be 140, 160, 180. So there is a correction that you can make um, for the temperature of the water here. Now, you can also use this formula to solve for different um, parts of the equation here. So if you're, for example, on this equation over here at the top right, if you're looking for the delta P, again, we're bringing in the uh, correction here for the um, the specific gravity, and we can uh, we can change that uh, the density of the water at different temperatures. We can correct for that here, and then bring that into the formula. So, um, what we did in the hydronics, I believe in hydronics number eight, is we actually uh, tried to make that a little bit easier for you. And we've got this um, this little correction uh, graph or table up here on the left. We also put a little um, example of how this would be used here. So now, again, with water being at a density of 62.4 at 60 degrees, if we want to solve for this at a different temperature, what we did is bring an example in here. And let's say we've got a, um, oh, maybe a thermostatic uh, radiator valve. And it's got a CV rating of 2.8, 2.8 gallons a minute with a 1 PSI drop. Now, if we're using 140 degree water and we're flowing 4 gallons a minute through that um, valve, we can solve for that. We can see what the pressure drop would be. So now what we're going to do is we're going to use this chart, and we can um, bring that number over here for the um, uh, at the, the density of water at that higher temperature at 140 degrees, just running up the chart here. And over here, that's where we get this number here. And then, of course, dividing that out, solve that. Now, that doesn't make a huge uh, difference if you look at the percentage there that that changes that number. But for the people that want to dial this in and get the exact, it is correct to use this um, temperature correction formula in the equation here to solve it um, accurately. Another little calculator that we use, and this is pretty handy because it just does the math for you by putting this in an Excel spreadsheet. Instead of having to do the math in the formula there on a calculator, we can just anything in the yellow box here, we can go in and we can um, put in the number that we want. And then basically what we're doing here, as long as you have two knowns, you can solve for the other unknown. So in this first box here, if we want to find the CV, let's say you go to a job site and there's a mixing valve or a blending valve or some sort of valve on the job site, and you don't know if that's been installed um, to the right spec, and you want to find out what the CV is, if you can measure the pressure across that, with a differential meter, a couple pressure gauges, and you can get the flow rate. Now, the flow rate, you can do that with portable meters these days. There's ultrasonic meters that you can uh, rent or borrow. If you know somebody that has one, you can get this flow rate. You can measure the pressure drop across that, and then that will tell you what the CV of that valve or device is. In this one here, in the middle box, if you wanted to find the flow rate down here in GPMs, if you know the pressure drop across the valve and you know the CV of the valve. And I put 7.5 in here because that is exactly one what the CV of our uh, Z1 zone valve is, one of our versions of our C1 zone valve. So Z1 zone valve, so flowing 7.5 gallons a minute through that valve, we have a 1 PSI drop. And so if we know that pressure drop and we know the CV of the valve is, we know how much flow is going through that device. 
And of course, on the third box here, if we wanted to find the pressure drop. So we know the CV of the device that's installed on the job site. It's printed right on it. We've got the tech brochure that tells us it's 3.5. Maybe it's a mixing valve. Uh, we know what the flow rate's going through there. Then we can tell what the pressure drop is. So um, this just makes it a little bit easier to do the calculations. These are, I found these at different places online. A lot of the manufacturers will have these specific to their products where you can plug in the, this information and get the results out of it. So how is it tested? What, um, after they established this in 1944, the CV number, they said, okay, this is the, the means to test the device or a valve. So this is a test bench apparatus, a little schematic of it. So you would have a source here of your fluid. You'd have these valves. And it's critical, these dimensions here. You'll see down at the bottom, it defines what these dimensions are, um, the distance from the device to where the meters are put and uh, where we do our temperature or our, our flow sensing and our pressure t uh, readings on this. Now, this uh, being the case, when you get a valve and you install it, it's not necessarily going to perform exactly the same as it does on the test bench because you might not have these dimensions in your installation. And other things happen when you manufacture a valve. You know, the tolerance that the valve is manufactured to the type of material. You know, sometimes the brass is a little bit more porous on one valve than the next. That will affect this to a little degree, too. But this is the standard. This is the one that's um, um, held by the... Uh, the ISA, the Instrument Society of America. And so when a manufacturer goes to um, start doing these testing, they'll build a test bench that would have these, um, this criteria, these dimensions in it. And I'll show you what we've done. This Bob, is a, a Bob, Bob, excuse me. Before you do that, uh, on slide 16, there was an interest from at least one party in that uh, okay. Excel-based tool there. So uh, after the webinar, if someone wants to have us send that out to you, we can do that um, uh, sometime uh, after we close the webinar, so no problem. Great, thanks. Um, so yeah, so getting back to it, so that's exactly what we did our lab at Cleffy is we took those dimensions and we built this test bench. Now, I, I, I want to caution you, you know, if you go to a hardware store and you pick a valve with a, a no-name handle or something on it and it has a CV rating on it, you don't know how that valve was tested or who tested or where that came from. We pride ourselves at Cleffy at being as professional as we can. You can see these are high-quality instruments. We even go to the extent that we put different uh, gradients of instruments. So if we're testing a small flow device, we've got a really accurate low flow meter, and you can see different size flow meters here. Um, we built this, as you can see, out of stainless steel. And then what we do, basically, is when we test this device here, this being a 2-inch um, air separator, disc L air separator, you have to test that device with the same size piping going to it. So you notice this little spool here will change and will modify and will build those to whatever device that we're testing. And then these here are pressure ports. Again, this dimension right here is spelled out in that, um, that ISA document that I showed you previously, what that dimension has to be. So this is what we feel the best way and the proper way to do it. So we're trying to get our numbers as accurate as possible. So um, we are building a, a lab test a facility similar to this in Milwaukee. This is the one that we have at our uh, Cuba Rosa lab over in, uh, in Italy at our factory there. So uh, you can see it's beautiful. Not only is it accurate, but uh, the stainless steel work and everything, it's a, it's, um, it's a sight to behold. And when you get a chance to go over to Italy, we'd love to take you through this lab and show you how we, how we do this. So that's a little bit about the uh, testing procedure and what it looks like and how we do it. And, um, and we test everything that we build on, a, on this bench and we get um, our CV rating. So the way we would express that when you buy one of our components, for example, that same disc scale that you were just looking at, here's the sheet that would be both on the website, it would be in our technical information on the, uh, sometimes this comes in the installation manual with the box. So the way you would use this again, this is one that is in metric units as well as um, U.S. units, you can see down here we've got our, our GPM flow rate. So if you would go up this, you would pick a flow rate, and you could run up the line, and you would see the, what the pressure drop is uh, through that device at different flow rates. So what we um, did with the, uh, let me go back a slide here, is when we make a component like this that's doing dirt or air removal, um, we know that typically the designer will design for a 2 to 4 feet per second flow rate going through a hydronic system just to make a, a noise-free and trouble-free system. We do test our devices much further um, out than that. In fact, we test this all the way out to 10 feet per second, and we still get excellent performance out of this. So um, just know that this does uh, a great job even with the uh, velocities that might be in excess of what's normally um, designed around in the industry. So here's a picture of uh, one of the job sites that came in the Cluffy Excellence uh, entry. You can see he's got a, a large uh, pump air pumping through this um, disc L air elimination device. 
Uh, interesting for me on this picture here, obviously he's got a tight quarters here, and you can see he's got these fairly close coupled. Uh, unlike a scoop type of air vent, this device will do an excellent job, even with this uh, closely coupled to the pump and also closely coupled to the to the tank over here. That's a um, a tank that's being used as a separator and a buffer tank on a job. And um, this also shows you that you know the test ports on the test rig were certainly much further out than that. So if you were to put test ports and measure it here, you're not going to get the same reading that you would on a test bench that we uh, developed that uh, CV number for this product. So. Uh, thanks for the picture, too, by the way. All right, so let's look at a couple uh, a different dirt uh, separation devices that um, that we manufacture that are on the market. The top one being a fairly common, fairly typical, uh, what's called a Y strain strainer, sometimes called a cartridge strainer. And uh, basically, we would take that valve, we would build it in a size, a one-inch size here. This is the all brass construction. And what we've done now is we've tested that. Use the formula over here, we put it on our test bench, and we came up with the... Um, with the CV number of 19. So again, 19 gallons a minute will flow through this device with a one pressure drop across it. Now what we've done down here is we show it a dirt separator. Now notice here on a one inch dirt separator, the same piping size, we've got a much higher flow rate through this. We've got a CV of three, uh, 33 gallons a minute going through this device uh, with a one pressure drop. And that has to do with the, uh, re the flow restriction as you go through this strainer in here. And also what we do with the separator type of device here, instead of just trapping the uh, dirt and debris in the cartridge into the strainer that's in this device here, we cause it to fall out of there. So if this device does its job, especially on dirty systems, we're dropping, we're separating the particles out, trapping them down here that you can come back later and uh, open this valve and blow it out. And this one happens to have a magnetic band, so if you've got some iron ferrite in your system, we're going to scrub that out of the system for you too, in addition to the, um, the particles that go through the median here and that we drop out. So. Um, so the pressure drop again, yeah, go ahead, Mark. I think it's important. We had a couple of questions coming in relative to the effects of uh, a glycol-based system or, um, or even water temperature other than 60, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So the equations you see on the slide here are assuming basically straight water approximately 60 degrees. Now, if you have glycol or you have water that is at a significantly different temperature than 60 degrees, the more um, complicated formula would be used that takes into consideration density. And the density of glycol-based systems are different than water, and the density of water at 150 degrees Fahrenheit is different than uh, 60, as an example. But we'll, we do have a slide later on that does clarify that a little bit. Yeah, we, we talked about the temperature correction one a, a couple of slides up, but we do, I think, have one that shows, uh, again, with a, a different type of fluid other than water in the system. But, yeah, thanks for those questions and the, the clarification, Mark. Um, so, okay, so let me show you what's going on with these two devices with a cutaway here. Again, there's the formula there for the for the, part, for the flow going through this. And now you can see just from the construction of these devices, this here, not only is the fluid going through and going down through the cartridge and back out there, but also, as I showed you earlier, this cartridge being in the fluid stream, any uh, particles that get trapped in there can uh, you know, start uh, throttling down the flow going through that device. And now we're showing this, um, these two numbers here. If we're flowing nine gallons a minute through this device, lower than the CV of the valve of 19, you can see the pressure drop. Uh, is only 0.22 psi, but notice um, down here, flowing nine gallons a minute through this device, much lower pressure drop because again we have a, a, a bigger, you know, passageway for the for the flow to go through this type of device. So a Y-strainer to me is like a final protection device. I'd like to see a, a good a dirt separator and air separator back at the uh, at, back at the mechanic room, back where the um, the boiler, the the cooling tower, whatever it might be. And then as the final protection device, and here's an example of an air handler up on the ceiling. Here's where we've got the Y-strainer. So this now we're going to get the big particles up before they get to this, but this is going to catch any fine uh, debris before it can get into. You can see we've got a control valve as well as a balancing valve on this installation here. So this is a just another level protection to make sure that we're not going to get any uh, uh, dirt or debris that would uh, hamper the performance or the accuracy of these two valves here. So that's why we offer both types of valves, both the, um, you can see the fine mesh and this type of here, as well as the uh, one that's getting the coarse one. Now, that being said, this type of separator will also get down to a 5 micron size, but it's a multiple pass um, device. It doesn't necessarily get the smallest particles out on the first go around, so any small ones that didn't get through, that did get through the coalescing media on the first trip, where you've got our second level 
for protection with this type of strainer up here. Now these, obviously, you've got to clean them out. You've got to blow them down. Most guys will install this with a, uh, a ball valve, possibly a hose connection here that you can open a valve and flush this out. If it gets plugged with a lot of debris, um, this is removable. And our valves and uh, our Y strainers, we've got a fine thread with an O-ring, so you can easily get this cap off, get in there, just pull that out and wash it out and clean it to make sure that you're getting uh, getting a good flow through that. I think I got some examples of that come up also. So yeah, there's the uh, Y strainer. You can see it's got an isolation valve on the side of it. Notice also that we put the pressure ports on this that you could test that. You could hook uh, some uh, piece plugs and hook a differential meter and then read when this cartridge is restricting the flow going through there instead of having to pull it out. So we give you those ports to be able to do that also. Uh, a great picture here. You can see the same things going on here, that he's protecting um, both the zone valve and then the flow setting device um, with a couple of the, um, uh, the Y strainers in here. I think this one's got a little bit of animation coming into it here. So you can see the balancing valve off to the right there, one of our uh, quick setters. And then a couple of our Z1 zone valves, the flow direction, again, going down through the Y strainer first, and then down through the uh, control valves, the balancing valves, and back out to uh, return them to the system. Thanks to Robert for that great slide. Uh, this picture, I think I'm going to go through this one pretty quickly. I meant to pull that out. I was a little concerned about the, um, the torch there and uh, his knee maybe bumping up against that. Sorry about that. Uh, a little bit better picture here as far as um, dirt separators being used on a couple boiler installations. Sorry about the yellow component at the top here, but uh, focus your attention, if you will, to the two um, Calepi components down at the bottom. Again, protecting the flow going into the, um, uh, into the boiler. Those are um, our dirt separators, our dirt cows. And again, you can see we want to keep the, the dirt out of, of course, the heat exchanger in here and also our pumps and any other components upstream of that. So we chose to put these on the, uh, the return side to the, um, to the boilers. <clears throat> Two of them there. Thank you. Um, this is another interesting job. A friend of ours, uh, Nathan, up in Kenai, Alaska, that sends us a lot of good slides. And basically what he's done here is he's put a couple different ones in because what he's done here is he's put, a, you can see one of our hydro separators over here also. This was a conversion on an old building up there that had an old rubber tube system in that's been uh, uh, causing problems with some of the components in the systems plugging up. So he's put the... Um, uh, Separators, again, protecting the pumps, but also in the system, knowing that those uh, systems are sometimes prone to shedding some of their, uh, some of their internal uh, uh, dirt and debris off the, the tubing for a period of time. So ongoing, I should say. It's a hard one to clean up. Now, here's a classic example of what, uh, what this would look like if you pulled this out of a really uh, dirty, contaminated system. And you can see it's pretty much plugged this up to the point where you can barely get flow through this device here. So that's why we make this so it can be um, blown down. Or if need be, in this case here, you probably wouldn't blow that out of that with just having a valve on there. So we make this, like I said, with a fine thread and an ring so you can pull that um, that little basket or that cartridge or that little strainer out of there and uh, flush it out and clean it out. So. Again, what happens here is you start plugging up a valve with this much debris, you're certainly going to change the flow rate through that device. And of course, the CV value is going to decrease because now you don't have that a nice clear pathway um, through there with the, um, with the plugged up strainer. There it is. There's an excellent cutaway of it. Um, you can see there where we've got the, uh, the isolation valve and again, where the, where the cartridge can be removed from that and the valve could be screwed into that flow path through that, again going from the left to the right. It actually comes in, it goes um, through the center of this, and it goes out through the outside. So the flow, as you can see on the, the plugged up cartridge over here to the right, that we flew, uh, that the flow went into this and then came through the mesh and then down, um, back out and downstream that way. Uh, just another picture of one that's not quite as bad as this one in the lower picture, but certainly uh, quite a bit of uh, debris plugged up on that, on that mesh there. So this is uh, this is coming out of our next, uh, like I said, Hydronic 15, where we go back in the separation, both dirt air and hydraulic. Uh, this was a great graph that was put together that shows um, the difference uh, between a, a dirt separator down here at the bottom when they're new and clean right out of the box. You can see the flow rate through this device here, a little bit more restriction here. But notice how when this thing is 70% plugged, what happens to the flow rate going through a, a strainer type of device. Uh, as it starts, I guess, do its job, which is remove some of the contaminants. But you can see it's going to be a lot more sensitive 
uh, to this type of plugging, and, and this is what it's going to do to your pressure drop going through that. That's why we show our valves with some pressure reports that you can uh, measure that, and you can know that um, when it's time to clean that, uh, disassemble that and clean that. All right, now let's start talking about um, zone valves a little bit because um, we make zone valves, different types of zone valves, as you can see here, with different CV ratings on some of them. But um, what's important here is that um, the different types of valves will have different C, uh, CV ratings, and I think you got a slide showing the cutaways coming up on this. So let me just go through the different valves here that we offer, this being a, a thermoelectric valve that heats up an open spring return, CV of 4, 4 gallons a minute through that with a 1 uh, PSI drop. We do offer that in a couple different sizes, but the CV stays the same. Uh, this valve over here, uh, we offer that in a couple different choices of CV ranges on our, uh, our Z1 valve, which is a motor-operated spring return type of valve. Um, and then over here, a pretty... Uh, big flow valve. This is basically a ball valve that just motorizes open and closed. You can see the CV of that since we are going through a full port ball valve is a 13. So those are um, our choices on zone valves. Now these valves are considered on-off valves. These don't modulate or stop anywhere in between. So uh, when we talk about the CV of this valve, this valve is either going to be closed completely or it's going to be full open. So that's why that number uh, that CV relates to the, um, the full open position of this valve here, this valve here, when they're full open, that's the, um, the CV of the valve. And this shows you a little bit better of what happens here. You can see a little bit of flow restriction where the flow has to come around through this passageway, around through that little, let's call that compression disc there, and back down through the, um, the outlet side of it. In the Z1 valve, which is what we call a flapper style valve, where this little flapper just uh, pivots on a hinge here and opens up, a little bit better flow pattern through that, but again, there's still some um, flapper in the flow stream when we're going through that. This valve here, being a full port ball valve, you can see it's got a wide open passageway through it. So, um, again, it depends on what your application is, what you, what, try, uh, what type of flow rates that you need to move through your systems, why you would select one valve or the, over the other here. These typically on this ball valve, guys like to use these on the pump and dump geo systems because they do have a good flow rate through them. So let me show you a little, uh, these are a couple pictures I took out on my workbench here of two of our uh, Z1 um, bodies here and two different uh, CV ratings. So what you'll notice if you look at this picture, these are the same size valve. There's a little bit closer maybe when I took this picture, but the thread size is the same. But you can see this one being a 2.5 CV um, has a much smaller port um, orifice in it than this one here being a 7.5. And you, uh, the question then becomes, well, why, why do you make so many different valves? You can see we offer valves um, in a 1, 2.5, 3.5, 5, 7.5 CV. And, in fact, some of these valves, a three-quarter valve, is available in all those different CV sizes. So the difference is over here in this column here is the shutoff pressure. The valve with the bigger port, this one here, the 7.5, that can shut off against 20 PSI delta P. So on your typical residential or uh, small hydronic system, that's plenty of close-off pressure. What you'll find as you go up here is the CV is the opening, the whole the orifice in the valve gets smaller, we can shut off against the higher delta P. Where do we sell this type of valve? I don't know of many systems out there that are operating under these kinds of uh, pressure conditions that you might find that in maybe a big high-rise hotel where there's a big pump down in the mechanical room that's uh, pumping a, a large uh, building and they're, they're running these pressures up around 50, 60 pounds. So we do have valves for that application. This is a small portion of our sales, but just know that if you see a spec for a valve that has to have a high close-off, we do offer that in our Z1 type of valve. You don't have to necessarily go to the, the ball valve type to get those kind of uh, uh, shut-off pressures. So what we can do here with this graph here is this shows our Z1 uh, valve at the different CV ratings, and this just shows the characteristics of the valve. So let's take, for example, uh, that we're going to flow two gallons a minute through a valve. So we would come down here to the bottom at uh, two gallons a minute, and we would just run up that line there. And you can see as we go to a valve with a, um, a smaller uh, CV, the one CV valve here, that the pressure drop on that valve at two gallon minute flow is up around uh, four uh, PSI, whereas you look at the valves with the wider uh, openings, larger ports, higher CV valves. Let's take this one right here as our um, um, uh, 5 CV valve right here and come down and look at that at 2 GPM flow and you can see how low the uh, pressure drop is. So that's um, again a chart that helps you decide what the application is going to be and what the best um, valve uh, for that job would be. I'll go through a couple glamour shots here just to show off some of the work of some of the uh, jobs that were sent to us. You can see a whole row there of our thermoelectric valves, uh, nicely installed diamond plate backing, a lot of tech mark control there. 
A uh, little smaller example here, again, of some of the uh, thermal uh, valves here. And what I want to show you on this one is this pump over here is a fixed speed pump. So what the installer has wisely chosen to do on this job is put a, a pressure-activated bypass valve here. So basically what happens is this pump knows one speed, full speed ahead. When all the valves are open, it's dividing its flow among these four different zones here. Now as these valves start shutting off, what we want to do is we want to shed some of the head energy that this pump is creating so we don't get noise or wear issues through the valve. And that's what this valve here is intended to do. Basically, just a diaphragm in there with a spring that you adjust the tension on that spring so um, the valves, as they start closing, you just start shedding and bypassing some of that flow. This was a smart move to put an isolation valve in there because when you go to pressure purge one of these, if you don't have a valve that you can shut off, what you do is you just all your flow goes right back to the, um, to the source here and it's hard to pressure purge those out. So uh, a nice installation and well planned. Pressure activated bypass. A valve that's probably disappearing as time goes by. In fact, here's the reason why. We're seeing more and more of these variable delta P pumps on the market. So you can see a lot of zone valves on this. No pressure or bypass valve is needed here because this pump's going to change its output based on how many zones are open and closing on this automatically uh, built right into the, the head of the pump. Uh, another example here of uh, some of our thermal actuators, same thing here. There's some of the delta P pumps that are on the market. Uh, this is a fixed speed pump here. Both of these that are going through the zone valves are um, uh, delta P pumps. And also some of our, uh, one of our discal air removal devices there. Uh, just a close-up shot again of some of our uh, valves installed. Oh, that one there probably paid for Mark's paycheck with that many valves on the job. But again, uh, delta P pumps uh, with a row of zone valves here, an excellent match for this type of uh, installation where the pump can adjust based on the number of zones that are open and closing. Another example here, uh, this um, shows our Z1 uh, motorized uh, spring return flapper style valve or paddle style valve. Same thing here, delta P pump, uh, fill valve air separation there. Um, this is one of the motorized ball valves here, full flow valve going to one of the radiant manifolds here. It's actually up in our building up in Milwaukee that goes out to one of our uh, um, our zones there on our radiant. All right, so this one here, let me show you. Um, this one here is a, a graphic uh, example of what's going on in the system. So basically what we've done is we've put our three different valves in here. You can see our thermal, electric, our motorized um, flapper style valve and also the uh, ball valve and you can see the CV of these different valves and now we put a pump in the circuit we started up with this pump and this pump is adding uh, one PSI so you can see what's going on now is this valve is going to allow 13 gallons a minute through it with the pressure drop here going from 15 to 16 pounds pressure. Um, this valve here being a 7.5 that's what we'll get through here I think I've got this animated in a little bit so with the one PSI drop, we would expect 13 gallons a minute to go through that valve. On the 7.5, we're going to get 7.5 GPM with that uh, one PSI that the pump had being established by the circulator down there and four uh, GPM on that one. So let's take that. And I'm sorry, this was supposed to animate in. But now let's take and increase the pump um, head here. So now we're going to take this up to where it's adding four um, PSI, so we're going from 16 pounds on the inlet side of the circulator. Maybe we set this up to a higher speed, and now we're up to uh, 20 pounds on the discharge side. So now what's going to happen with these valves here? We need my other animation in there. They should have come in one at a time. Sorry. You can see now that we've basically doubled the flow rate going through this valve with just a 4 PSI increase in the uh, head added to the circuit by the pump here. So this one now we've got 26 gallons a minute, 15 gallons a minute here, and 8 gallons a minute here. So um, this uh, correlation here, basically what we're showing is we um, have a four a pound increase in the in the head pressure that we're adding this, we're actually doubling. So that's the ratio there. You can see a two um, ratio there that we're doubling the flow rate going through that as we increase the head by four PSI. Mark, can you, is that a good explanation of that? This is a slide that Mark put together for me. I think I'm... I'm yeah, basically this slide uh, carries from the last one. In the prior slide, we were showing if each of the zone valves were to experience a 1 PSI pressure drop, what would be the resulting flow rate through each of those valves given their different CV ratings? And with 1 PSI pressure drop, we can see from the formula that, uh, in essence, at 1 PSI pressure drop, your flow rate becomes the same value as the CV rating of the valve, okay? 
Now, if we were to now increase the pump pressure ahead to some significantly higher than one PSI, say to four PSI, yeah. we can see what the resulting flow rate is across those valves, 26, 15, and 8. In fact, the spread gets larger between valves as you increase your pressure drop because of the nonlinear behavior of pressure drop related to flow. So that was what that was meant to okay. illustrate. Thanks. All right, let's move on to thermostatic valves. This is a big selling valve for us. And what's unique about this valve is it gets used in a bunch of different applications. Um, it can be used as both a mixing valve on a radiant system if we're trying to mix down a temperature for a, a pump circuit, but it also gets used on a, an open system application like a domestic water mixing valve. So this is our 521 valve over here. This is a CV of 3. And then we make a larger valve. This would be a 2-inch size, a high-flow valve. It has a CV of 22. So what's important when you look at this valve is to look at the chart and see what, um, what that equates to. So the question becomes to um, an installer is, okay, how many gallons a minute can I safely move through this valve? What, what happens if I, if I have to put, say, 10 gallons a minute through this valve? Well, if you go, again, CV at 3, so that would mean at 3 gallons a minute down here at this bottom line, if you go up the chart here where we cross over the uh, curve line there, you'll see that we've got a 1 PSI drop at 3 gallons a minute. So now let's say your job, uh, let's first say we've got an, uh, a domestic water heater that we're going to put a thermostatic mixing valve on, and they've got a couple showers and a tub and a dishwasher, and with everything running at one time, they're going to have a flow rate of 10 GPM going through that valve. So if you run up the line here at 10, what you'll see now is you've got a pressure drop of, what are we, approximately a 10 PSI pressure drop at 10 gallons a minute going through there. So what you need to know now is that the pressure that's coming through this valve, the flow pressure coming into it from your well system, your water system, you're going to take that much pressure drop across it. So you want to be careful here that if you only have 30 pounds pressure and you come in your house and you're going to run this valve up at, say, maybe 12 uh, GPM, that, you know, you're going to lose 20 pounds pressure going across that. The people taking the shower maybe on the second floor are going to have a trickle of water. So it's not a matter of uh, how much valve the valve can handle as far as the flow rate, but what's going to happen to the piping and other components downstream of this, and I think I've got some good examples of that coming up. So now with that in mind, if you've got a high flow requirement, you might want to look at a, um, a valve that can uh, flow at the, uh, one of our high flow valves that can flow up to a 22. Let me go back a couple. But, but now there are some trade-offs here. If you were to put only this valve in, let's say, a large home where they had six showers and people were going to come in after skiing and everybody's in the shower at once, this would give you plenty of capacity with very little pressure drop. But the trade-off is if you're getting down to low flow rates, let's say somebody just opens a kitchen sink and you've only got, you know, maybe a half gallon minute flow rate, the accuracy of this valve under low flow conditions starts to uh, go away a little bit. So sometimes installers will choose to use these in conjunction with one another. You just basically pipe the two of these together. So when there's a low flow condition, this valve is taking the, uh, the control of it and making sure you've got accuracy at a, you know, maybe a half gallon minute flow when everybody opens every hot water faucet in the, in the building and you're looking at the high flow rates, this valve allows the flow rate to go through there and still have a good uh, temperature control. Another way that you could address that is sometimes an installer will put a high flow valve like this at the um, back at the uh, water heater or back at the indirect tank with their resplined water, and then maybe use like a little point of use valve right at the faucet, right under the sink or behind the, uh, the shower valve or something like that, or buy a shower valve with that built into it too, just so you get the accurate control at the final uh, fixture where you're using the water so you don't... Um, have some temperature instability there with the valve that's oversized for the application. <clears throat> and there's an example, a classic example, where a thermostatic mixing would be on, the, on this water heater, possibly to run that water heater in the uh, elevated temperature, maybe 140, 160 degrees, and now we're being able to uh, regulate that down to a, a probably 120 degrees going out to the building. So that's the uh, domestic water application of that valve, which, by the way, is a low lead valve. So that is appropriate for that application. In this one, we wanted to show it as a mixing valve on a, um, on a radiant system here. So again, this valve, you're going to have to make sure that the size of this valve allows enough flow to go on. You can see it's only got three zones on this. So let's say they're you know, maybe one gallon per minute per zone. Um, that valve can easily handle that uh, flow rate going through there. Now, this pump has to be able to overcome the pressure drop through that. So if you did have, you know, 10 zones on this and you needed a higher flow rate, let's say going back to 12 GPM, you'd have to make sure that this pump has the ability to overcome the pressure drop through the valve at the higher flow rates. And that's getting back to what you would look at here. So this would be used both for um, sizing and seeing with the performance of the valve under uh, flow conditions, both for domestic water as well as you're using it on a pumped hydronic system. 
noise. So occasionally you'll have a job where you've got this noise uh, that you hear in the system and you go over there and a couple causes of noise and, and it can be when you uh, have cavitation that can be caused by a valve as well as a pump or something like that. And basically what cavitation is a cavity in water basically. It's just a, uh, a hole in the water is one way of looking at it. So it's a, a formation, a collapse of um, vapor and that noise that you hear is those bubbles actually imploding inside there. Another noise that you might hear is actually flashing, which is similar to cavitation, but the difference between flashing is the liquid vaporizes, but it never goes back to a, uh, a liquid. And where you would see flashing sometimes, the analogy maybe would be on a solar collector up on a roof when there's a no-flow condition. Um, the water in there gets above the, uh, the boiling point, and you would flash it uh, to a vapor there. And another uh, thing that can cause this to happen is if you take a valve and you flow it way down, you choke it, it's called the choke flow condition. So take one of the uh, um, you know, balancing valve or something like that and flow it all the way down to the lowest point and you've got a, a high head pump trying to go through there, you can get that noise being created by that choke flow condition. And what that can lead to, and this is a, um, I've actually got a sample of a fitting almost identical to this on my job site that I took out of, it was on a domestic water recirculation system and they had a grossly oversized pump, and you can see what's happened here is the flow velocity coming through this um, this elbow here is actually starting to road away some of the material, some of the copper inside there. Now, a couple things I noticed on this, it looks like they didn't ream this copper tube by putting the pipe in there that you don't ream this burr off after you cut it. You can actually cause some turbulence in here that can compound this problem with the flow going through there not only at high velocity, but now this little um, uh, restriction caused by the unreamed copper tube in there can also add to that. The one I've got actually pinholed right through the end of it where this is just, you can see where it's eroded, corrosion erosion, it's called, it's actually starting to wear away that fitting there. So um, again, what I'm trying to show here is not necessarily the limitation what can go through the valve. If our valve can move 12 gallons a minute, you got to make sure you're piping it and all your other components that you put in the system are also able to handle the flow rate that you're going to, that you're going to move through the device. Um, all right, so the question becomes, are there products whose CV value can change as operating conditions change? Yes, and we do make a valve. This is what's um, one of our uh, 127 valves. So this valve is built a little differently inside in that it has a, uh, a pressure-independent balancing uh, mechanism inside, and basically it's used in applications you, where you want to make sure that your flow rate stays consistent regardless of what's going on in the building. Maybe you've got a building with 100 rooms, all have air handlers like this in it, and you want to make sure regardless how many are called on, how many are calling for heat or flowing, that you always nail the exact flow rate to every one of them under varying conditions. And the way that happens inside this here is there's a spool that's allowed to float around in there, and it's got a uh, precision cut um, passageway in it right here. This would be a 10 gallon minute flow here. And basically what that does now is this valve, um, the spool inside this valve is allowed to float to move across this and it basically opens and closes this port here. Uh, you can see the water is coming around the outside of that. It actually goes down through this little window that's cut in there and then through the valve here. So as the pressure changes, the delta P in the system changes, this can move. So this can adjust its um, flow rate based on what's happening to the um, pressure coming into that. And this is a, a little graphic example. Now, the, the, um, one of the limitations of this valve is it's got to work between a 2 and 32 pound pressure differential here. Obviously, if you fall below 2 pounds pressure, let me go back to this slide, what will happen is this spool will just relax all the way to this, um, this position here, and it doesn't have any adjustability to change this opening size. And if you go above that, if you go above 32 pounds, what will happen is this spool will be shoved all the way to the end, and again, it can't float freely in there, so it won't be able to regulate. So that is uh, the requirement of this valve when you size it. Now, that is a very wide range. Again, we're talking about the delta P that the pump is going to add to your piping circuit. Somewhere between 2 and 32 pounds is a, a fairly wide range for that valve to work in. All right, now I'm going to close up with this here. So how does this all apply to you when you go to design a job? You've got an installer that says, okay, I'm going to put together a system. I'm going to use some of these valves. I'm going to have zone valves in there. I'm going to have different types of valves. How do I crunch all these numbers together so that it makes sense when I go to size my system and select the pump? Well, there's a number of different software uh, programs out on the market. This is one that I like and happen to use. It's uh, simple to use. It's got a lot of different modules at the top. And I'm going to show you some of those that you would go through as you're going to size the system and select these uh, different components. So I just quickly drew up a little schematic of a fairly typical, um, I left some of the components out. I don't have a fill valve and some other things here just to simplify it. But basically, I've just got a circuit here going through a couple of Z1 zone valves, 7.5 Z1 zone valves there, and just a couple fin tube uh, baseboard elements here. 
I've got a, a load on this system of about uh, 150,000 BTU. So I've got 150,000 BTU boiler in here. I want to select the circulator. I want to determine what size piping I need here. I want to know what kind of pressure drop is going to be created by these different uh, components that I'm going to put into the uh, piping system. So I start to go in here and I use some of the different modules in here. So here's one that's a um, uh, equivalent length calculator. So basically what we're going to do with all these components that we're putting in here, these valves and these uh, ball valves and different components, is we're going to turn them into a piping length, an equivalent piping length. So we're going to treat these all as pipe in addition to the fittings and everything. And I'll show you the table that we do that. So we're going to count every fitting, every elbow, every T, every uh, valve or device that we put in there, and we're going to um, uh, turn it into a piping length. So what I've done here is I've selected a valve, a 7.5 uh, CV valve, I just put a 12 GPM flow rate in the, through that valve, and now it's going to tell me what, again, I used 180 degree temperature here. So this does um, also adjust for the temperature going through it. And also, we talked a little bit earlier about different types of fluid. I can select glycol, different percentages mix, and that's going to change this. So basically what we did now is we've taken that 7.5 valve right here, this uh, Z1 valve with a 7.5 CV. We're going to flow 12 gallons a minute through it to this one zone here. So this is what that's going to be equivalent to is 27 feet of three-quarter copper pipe. So now I take that number, and then I put that into some of my other uh, tables here. But what's important now is when I start doing my pipe sizing, I want to know what size pipe I want to use and why that's important is because of the flow velocity going through. So going back to that copper elbow I just showed you, if you go through that uh, fitting at high velocity, at high flow rates, you can cause wear to that. So on a hydronic system, we want to design our system to flow somewhere between 2 and 4 feet per second. I know some engineers are comfortable going up to 5 feet per second. So let's take that job now, and we're saying, okay, 12 gallons a minute, I want to flow through that common piping in that circuit there. Um, I'm going to flow through that 180 degrees. What size pipe do I need to start piping that system together? Well, this little table, you put all that information out, hit Enter, and it's going to tell you, well, if you use inch and a quarter pipe, you're going to have a flow velocity of 2.9 feet per second. So that's just perfect. That's right between our 2 and 4 feet per second. Look what's happened if an installer says, well, I'm just going to use some three-quarter pipe because that's what I've got on my truck. You can see that our flow velocity going through there is going to get pretty high. So this is going to use, be used to tell you what size pipe you need to be able to uh, pipe that together and make sure that your flow velocity is in an acceptable range. And then the table on the right here, um, same thing. What I wanted to show you then is... Um, now we can take some of these fittings that we put in there, and we can use this module here. And basically, uh, the type of tube we're using, you can select the type of copper. Now I'm going to start putting in my fittings. So um, the number of elbows I put in the circuit here, uh, the type of valves, and the number of valves I put in there. Remember, I showed you a couple of wall valves. I showed you some T's, some elbows going in there. And now see, we've got this equivalent length. So now to that, you would add the equivalent length of the, uh, the uh, 7.5 valves that I showed you earlier. And that's how you come up with all the list here. So now let me just kind of animate this into the picture here. That's the equivalent piping for my, uh, my circuit here, my common piping circuit here. Inch and a quarter pipe is what I'm going to pipe this with. Since these only have uh, 12, uh, uh, 10 to 12 gallons a minute there, I'm going to divide my two uh, zones here across my 150,000 BTU, which would be 15 gallons a minute. Um, so I can size that pipe size by um, knowing what the flow rate is going through the branch loops here. So that would work with a one-inch pipe on that. So that's this uh, last module here is where I size these loops here. So that's how you want to use this information that, um, that I'm showing you today to um, not only for designing new systems, for troubleshooting systems. If you've got a noisy system, if you've got a system that's underperforming, not getting enough heat, you can go to that job. You can start looking at some of the components that were used in there, find the data sheets on them, uh, pull out the information, see what kind of load you're trying to move through that valve, see if you've got the right size pump to be able to do that. And um, hopefully this has cleared up some, uh, some questions on that. Great turnout, and hopefully this information was useful and I presented it in an understandable and uh, uh, useful way for you. But uh, let us know again. I like the critiques. I like the uh, comments. Uh, let me have it. So um, thanks, everybody, again, for tuning in today.